From volcanic eruptions to torrential rain, Japan is one of the world's most disaster-prone countries. Earthquakes, too, are surprisingly frequent. Throughout history, Japan has suffered many major quakes of magnitude 7 or greater. To ensure people can protect themselves and their communities in earthquakes, drills are organized by the government and private sector. This time on Japanology Plus, our theme is earthquake preparedness. We'll look at some of the highly advanced techniques used in Japan to minimize the loss of life and damage in an earthquake. Hello and welcome to Japanology Plus, I'm Peter Barakan. If you live in a country that doesn't have any earthquakes, you may be astounded to know that Japan experiences over a thousand earthquakes a year, and that's not counting the ones that are so small you don't even notice them. Japan sits on top of the so-called Ring of Fire, which is an area of heightened volcanic activity around the Pacific Ocean. And as a result, it's one of the most earthquake-prone countries in the world. Because of that, it also spends more time and energy on being prepared for earthquakes than any other country. There are evacuation drills held regularly by community groups, local authorities, even private companies. We're going to start off today with a look at earthquake preparedness in Tokyo's central business district over here. The area of Tokyo centered on Otemachi is a major business district at the hub of the Japanese economy. It is home to the offices of 4,000 or so leading Japanese companies and about 230,000 workers. How do those who work here keep themselves ready for an earthquake? Minoru Watanabe is a journalist who covers disaster preparedness and risk management. For more than 30 years, Watanabe has been reporting from the scenes of disaster in Japan and around the world. He also advises national and local governments on disaster planning. We're going to be talking about earthquake preparedness. What makes this area in particular a good place to start? The office buildings in this district in particular set the standard for disaster preparedness. Preparedness varies by location. Different areas of the city have different approaches to disaster preparedness. This area has an especially large number of high-rises, and hundreds of thousands of people work here. If you get a really big earthquake, are they really going to be safe? There is almost no possibility that any of these buildings would collapse, even in a very large earthquake. Considering how massive these buildings are, the standards for constructing them are correspondingly rigorous. They have to be. In fact, they are probably the strictest building standards in the world. Such large buildings are very heavy. And in order to support that weight, they have extremely deep foundations. And in the event of an earthquake, advances in technology allow more recent high-rises to sway with the shaking of the earthquake rather than try to just resist rigidly. By enabling swaying and by dispersing the shock, these construction techniques minimize damage to the building. In March 2011, northeast Japan was hit by a magnitude 9.0 earthquake, the largest in Japan's recorded history. Even though the epicenter was 350 kilometers away from Tokyo, high-rise buildings there swayed as the ground shook. Even if a high-rise building resists collapse, there can still be danger to its occupants. This property management firm has put in place a model program for occupant safety. You see that? Ah. Uh... It's bolted to the wall. 
The furniture is bolted down so it can't fall over. Because furniture shifts in a quake. You can imagine what would happen if this toppled over on someone. They could be hurt or even killed. In 1995, Western Japan was struck by the Great Hanshin Earthquake. This magnitude 7.3 quake claimed 6,434 lives. Hundreds of people were killed or injured by furniture toppling over. Taking lessons from this tragedy, there was a push to secure furniture in homes and offices against future earthquakes. At this national research facility, a full-sized building has been erected on a shake table to test the effectiveness of securing furniture in a major earthquake. Here is what happens with unsecured furniture. And here, furniture is thoroughly secured. It's clear that building occupants can be kept much safer by securing furniture. This property management company with a model occupant safety program distributes key disaster supplies to all its staff. Can you please show us what you, do, what you have? Sure. Here's my safety helmet. Oh, does everybody have one of these? Yes, the company distributes helmets fitted with lights to everyone. I provided my own goggles as I thought they'd be useful to protect my eyes from dust and debris while evacuating. So in the event of an earthquake, what's your drill? What do you have to do? In an earthquake, the first priority is to avoid injury. Getting injured will prevent you from doing anything else. So I'll duck under my desk and put my helmet on to protect my head. Oh, OK. There's not a lot of space under there. No, but if there are any falling objects, under the desk is the oh. safest place to be. We've all been taught that since oh. childhood. Along with her helmet, Morishima has a supply kit that she put together herself. Here's my medical kit for emergencies. Oh. There's a whistle to call for help and a torch. Well, you're really well prepared. And do you have this under your desk the whole time? Yes. After the big 2011 earthquake, I became more conscious that a serious earthquake could strike at any time. So I started keeping these supplies right under my desk. Uh. Being prepared at all times so that I can act calmly in an earthquake is important for protecting my own life. And it's also important for protecting the lives of those around me. It's great that she has disaster supplies at the ready, within easy reach. Having them off in a locker somewhere makes no sense. You don't have time to go and fetch them, so you should keep them close by. Large buildings like this are made ready for various people, not just those who work there. A real estate firm that owns many office buildings and commercial facilities in the area showed us their supplies. In this storage facility, we keep emergency supplies. These supplies are for distribution to people who might happen to be shopping here when a big earthquake strikes. The company keeps a supply of food, such as nutrition bars and bottled water, for the use of any members of the public stranded in an earthquake. In fact, when the 2011 earthquake struck, most of the public transit in the Tokyo metropolitan area was shut down. That left some people with no way to get home unless they walked for hours. As a result, a lot of people had to stay overnight wherever they were. In total, 5.15 million people were stranded. This company's thorough preparedness enabled them to shelter many of the stranded people on the floors of the buildings they manage. 
In fact, we put this to use in the 2011 earthquake. On that occasion, we accommodated about 3,000 stranded people in the Maranochi district alone. So you've got provisions here for how many people, roughly? This storage facility is designed to supply about 1,000 people, providing a minimum of six meals per person, with a certain margin of surplus. Basically, enough to support 1,000 people here for three days. Along with food, we set aside other important supplies, for example, these aluminium-coated pads. The floors of commercial buildings are quite cold, so these pads can be laid out on the floor, like this, and stranded people can sit or sleep on top of them, so that's how it's used on the floor. Alternatively, it can be wrapped around the shoulders like a cape to retain body heat. This will keep you warm. Keep yourself warm. Yes, that's exactly the point. As we construct new buildings, we're always increasing the amount of emergency supplies. Next, let's see how disaster preparedness looks in an older residential neighborhood of Tokyo. Most of the homes here are old-fashioned wooden structures. The biggest danger in an earthquake is the outbreak of fire. In 1923, Tokyo suffered a magnitude 7.9 earthquake that caused numerous fires in which 210,000 homes burned. It was a horrific catastrophe. Nearly 90% of the estimated 100,000 victims were killed by fire. Let's see what precautions local residents of this neighborhood have taken against fires. See how narrow this street is? It's a tiny little alleyway, yeah. yeah. Which means fire trucks couldn't get down this street in the event of a fire. That's why neighborhoods with narrow streets like this one have a large number of fire extinguishers installed, like this one. Okay, so one down there, one here, there's another one over here yes, as well. Yes. Oh. That enables local residents to start extinguishing the fire before the firefighters arrive. They have a chance to prevent the fire from getting out of control in an area like this. Uh, uh. We've got some people from the local community group to help us out here today. Thank you all for coming down. I see you have quite a lot of fire extinguishers here. Were they provided by the local authorities or did you buy them yourselves? How did that all happen? Some of them were provided by the local government, but most were purchased by the neighborhood association. There are about 80 fire extinguishers in this small neighborhood. When a fire breaks out, starting to extinguish it as soon as possible is crucial. So, to ensure everyone is ready to act at any moment, monthly drills are held for residents of all ages. Here's a drill that uses a fire hydrant and a hose from inside this manhole. Normally, hydrants are used only by the fire department itself. But to ensure neighborhood residents can fight a blaze themselves in the event that firefighters can't get there in time, an arrangement has been made to enable residents to use it too. Oh. From grassroots drills like this to ones mandated by regulations, Periodic earthquake readiness drills are part of life in Japan. Tokyo's Ginza district is usually full of shoppers. Here, the main street is closed to vehicle traffic once a year for a large-scale disaster drill. The event is organized by local residents and businesses and draws about 5,000 participants. The scenario is a major quake of magnitude 7 or more. With the cooperation of local fire and police authorities, rescue crews demonstrate evacuations from buildings. 
local residents practice transporting injured people. For decades, evacuation drills have been held in primary and junior high schools around Japan. In recent years, many schools have worked to make their drills more realistic. At this primary school, children are not told in advance when a drill will be held. When they hear the warning sounds, they must act immediately. In the event of an earthquake, protecting your head takes first priority. Through repeated snap drills, children develop an immediate reflex to protect their heads when a quake strikes. Lessons learned from major earthquakes are being put to use in drills across Japan to save lives whenever the next quake strikes. Hi, I'm Matt Alt. Now in Japan, earthquake preparedness isn't just something for big organizations or neighborhoods. It's something to be done on the personal or the household level as well. To that end, if you go to places like hardware stores or home centers, you can often find a huge array of products that are designed to help you make your way through a disaster situation. For example, here's some dry shampoo that you can use if the water supply is ever turned off. It doesn't need water, you can just massage it into your hair. There's equipment like this. This is designed to attach to the top of cupboards or bookshelves and prevent them from falling over in case of a big shake. But one of the key things to making your way through a disaster is what's known as an emergency bag. These bags are designed to hold all sorts of gear, equipment, and items to help you when you need to leave your house for whatever reason in the course of a disaster. But there's so much stuff out there. What exactly should you put into your emergency bag? That's what we've come here to find out today from an advisor who's an expert on that very topic. Today I'm here with Mr. Tomoya Takani, who is a disaster management advisor. Well, this certainly looks like a lot of useful stuff, but what, what are the rules for packing a bag like this? This is an emergency bag, so you need to be able to run while carrying it. It's important that it does not feel like it's weighing you down when you carry it. There are four essentials the bag needs okay. to be packed with. The first thing is gear to protect yourself from physical harm, like a torch and gloves, and a waterproof top in case you evacuate in the rain. Yes, this is a really good idea. How about these masks? Yes, they're good to have. The trouble with a torch like this is that it takes up one of your hands, so a light that you wear on your head is even better. Right, I see these in camping stores and things like that. These items should be placed in an outer pocket, where you can access them immediately when you have to get away in a hurry. The second essential is a day's supply of food and water. If you put all this in, the bag will get too heavy. So just one day's worth is plenty. Okay, so what is uh, one day's worth of liquid, for example? The benchmark is three liters per person per day. But for an emergency bag, one and a half to two liters should suffice. Well, this looks like a 1.5 liter bottle. How about this? For ease of drinking straight from the bottle, I recommend smaller ones. Good point. Okay. Hi. That's one liter's worth. And one more. As for that, it's quite convenient to have your water and nutrition all in one. So for the last portion of water, I recommend choosing nutritional gels instead. Interesting. So this is kind of like a sports uh, beverage, I guess. Well, we'll put that Let's there. put in three of those gel packs. Yes. Two, three. Okay. Next, the food. When you're tired, your body needs energy, so you shouldn't be trying for low-calorie foods or anything. You need something that can be eaten with no cooking or prep required. So this is no time for a diet, is what you're saying. Biscuits and chocolate and other foods you can eat directly with no implements needed are best. The third essential is first aid, sanitation and hygiene supplies. That would include wound care treatments and bandages, a change of underwear and a towel. 
Another hygiene issue is the toilet. For that, there are bags like this. It contains a powder that will solidify feces or urine. Having one or two of these in your pack is advisable. The last essential is information on where to go, a radio and map. What is this map? This shows what areas in your neighborhood could be dangerous, and also evacuation spots. We call it a hazard map. Ah, oh, this is really useful. And definitely, the, uh, if you have a radio, I'm assuming you're going to need batteries as well. Absolutely. That completes the four essentials. And Takani also carries photographs of his family. You could become separated from family members in evacuation centers. Photos are handy to have when looking for them. Include a photo of yourself with your contact information. That helps others identify you if you are injured and unconscious. Other important information includes your blood type in case you need a transfusion. That's the final essential for a proper emergency bag. Try slinging it on your shoulder, Matt. Okay, time to gear up here. Oh, oh this feels good. Th this feels like a good weight. Do you think you could run with that on? Oh, definitely. This is, I could easily run with this. The total weight of the supplies in the bag is about four kilograms. Under five is the target for adults. You know, I had known the kind of big picture of needing to be prepared, but seeing all the little details really helps me build a picture in my head of what to do. Well, there you have it. I hope you never have to use the tips and techniques that we learned here today, but just in case, it helps to be prepared. See you next time. Now for a visit to a municipal-run disaster preparedness education center. The center has facilities that allow visitors to experience simulated earthquakes. They can practice using fire extinguishers and experience simulated rainstorms. There are more than 70 such facilities around Japan offering immersive experiences to heighten disaster awareness. My impression is that Japanese people have a relatively high level of awareness of the need to be prepared for earthquakes and other disasters. But from talking to you today, I get the impression that you think that there's still room for improvement. After the earthquake on March the 11th, 2011, there was a sudden surge in disaster preparedness awareness among people in Japan. But the survey showed that just two years later, the situation had changed. 70% of people had become less conscious of disaster preparedness. Mm. Having people actually experience the effects of an earthquake in a facility like this is the most effective way to heighten public awareness and then to sustain that awareness. And that's why such facilities are built. Mm. This simulator can recreate massive quakes Japan has experienced in the past. Peter will be experiencing a magnitude 7.3 quake, one with intense vertical shaking due to the epicenter being directly below. So now you'll be trying out this earthquake simulator. I'm not going to give you any advance warnings. I just want you to experience it and think of ways to protect yourself. It's actually, it, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Yes. Um, it, it's still, it's scary. You don't know what's going to happen. So you kind of stiffen up. Uh, I don't know if I should have been underneath the table. Perhaps that would have been better. But um, I don't think I really had 
enough presence of mind to really think about that. I just grabbed onto something so that, you know... Uh, well, as you say, you didn't manage to get under the table. And that is the most important thing you should have done. You've got to protect your head. That's essential. You need to get in the habit of ducking under a table, even when you feel slight shaking. When a big quake hits directly below, you can lose your composure. And that's what just happened to you. Ah. I think for people watching this program from outside Japan, they think, if it's that dangerous, why would you want to live in this country? And sometimes I thought that myself. But, you know, you, you've made your choice. You're going to live in a country, and you, you then have to do whatever it takes. And um, as you've said, there's absolutely no room for complacency. On the other hand, I suppose you have to go on living your life and enjoying your life. You can't be you know, wandering around thinking, when's the next earthquake going to happen? Mm -hmm. Every day, you know, every waking minute of your day. But on the other hand, I suppose the idea has to be there somewhere. So when you get on the train or when you're driving your car, yeah, yeah. always this has to be just a little bit of awareness of it could happen today. With earthquake preparedness, it's not enough to be sort of prepared. You need to know exactly what to do to protect yourself in each situation. And it shouldn't be just disaster experts like myself teaching. Everyone should give real thought to what is needed in order to be ready to get through an actual earthquake. That really helps them to be prepared. You don't have to carry a three-day supply of food with you wherever you go. But if a quake does strike while you are on your commute, what is the absolute minimum of things you should have on your person at all times? Everyone should come up with their own answer and try it out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next time on Japanology Plus, wrapping and packaging. From rice balls to wine bottles, Japanese products showcase the ultimate in aesthetic appeal and ingenious skills.